In the 11th and 12th centuries, in North and Central India, great temples were being made in the Nagara style. The Dravid or South Indian style prevailed in magnificent temples which were being constructed in Tamil Nadu. In the Deccan, which lay in between North and South India, hill chieftains named the Hoysalas were gradually coming into power and creating a kingdom in southern Karnataka. Hoysala history is clear from the time of Vishnu Vardhana, who ruled from 1108 to 1142. Inscriptions show that the king, his wife and his ministers were generous patrons of temples. King Vishnu Vardhana defeated the imperial Cholas in 1116. This was a landmark in the establishment of his dynasty. To commemorate his victory, he built the temple of Keshava or Chenna Keshava at Belur in present-day Karnataka. He named it the Vijay Narayana or the Victorious Vishnu. The temple is a classic example of the ornate style of temple art under the Hoysalas. They inherited a rich tradition of temple building from the dynasties before them, the Chalukyas and the Cholas. The Chalukyas had made magnificent temples at Pattadakkal in the 8th century and at other sites. Further south, the Cholas had created great temples in the region of Tamil Nadu. The Hoysalas borrowed freely from both traditions and created a style which is a rich blend of northern and southern influences. Vishnuvardhana, who was a subordinate of the Chalukyan ruler, who fought endlessly against the Chalukyas in the Chalukyan territory and nearly won most of the battles, felt at the end, probably, that while he could rebuild an empire, which was earlier, you see, uh, was, was the monopoly of the Chalukyas, whether he would be able to rebuild the kind of an empire which they had built up in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, decorating his uh, entire landscape, you see, with beautiful temples. That was the question. He didn't want to, to appropriate the territory, but they wanted, he wanted to appropriate their cultural skill also, their culture also, their art also. So during the long marches that he had in the Chalukyan territory, he could not help but wonder at the more or less see, temples there. So when he ascertained his power, independence, and he established a new capital, the first thing that happened to, to him was to, 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 to create something which the Chalukyas had created in his own empire. The Keshava temple dedicated in 1117 stands in a large courtyard. It has a pillared mandapa or hall, an antechamber and a shrine. It rests on a plinth which follows the shape of the temple itself. The shikara or tower of the temple is no longer there, which gives a flat appearance to the structure today. The mandapa would originally have been a pillared open hall. The later Hoysala king, Balala II, added carved window screens. These give the mandapa a more closed feeling now. Such screens continue the tradition of Western Chalukyan temples in the Deccan, such as the Lad Khan in Aihole. The exterior of the temple is more profusely sculpted than ever before in a manner which has come to be known as the ornate Hoysala style. 
Horizontal rows of carvings run around the temple in an ordered and highly organized design. Every inch of wall surface is sculpted, often in miniaturized detail. The temple has the richest surface texture seen in any in India. The bands of carving which go around the structure run for over 700 feet. The elephants we see below number about 2,000. The exterior walls present the world of forms, the material universe we perceive around us. Here, at the temple, the world is seen in its true perspective. It is seen as a manifestation of the truth beyond, which is in the Garbhagriha, or womb chamber, deep inside the temple. The Hoysala artist paid the greatest attention to detail. Every limb of each figure, every decorative design, shows this preoccupation. There appears to be a limitless devotion and time which the sculptor must have put into his laborious work. Every unit of work is remarkable in its intricacy of design, depth of detail and skillful craftsmanship. However, the sense of fluid movement and balance to be found in other contemporaneous Indian sculpture is not here. The figures and decorative motifs are deeply undercut and stand out most effectively against dark shadows. The best known sculptures here are of the Madanakais, the bracket figures, beneath the overhanging roof of the Mandapa. Bracket figures are also a theme which continue from the art of the Western Chalukyas of the Deccan. These are Nayakas or beautiful women who are seen in Indic art from early times. They represent the fertile abundance of nature. The fullness of the figures and ornamentation is somewhat similar to the idiom of nearby Kerala. The sculptures are a celebration of beauty. The depiction of youthful maidens is considered by medieval texts to be an essential ornament of temples. Of all the themes presented by the Hoysala artists, dance appears to be the most favoured. We see men and women dancing, with and without musical instruments. Almost all the deities are also seen in dance postures here. This is a celebration of the beauty and possibilities of the human form, which is here imaged as divine. The emblem of the Hoysala dynasty is a man killing a lion. This is based upon the story of Sala, who was a tribal. He saved a meditating Jain Sadhu by killing a lion who was about to pounce on him. With the blessings of the sadhu began the rise to power of Sala and the Hoysala dynasty he founded. To create the images in such detail, the artists used an appropriate stone. When quarried, chloritic schist is extremely soft and easy to cut. It becomes harder and long-lasting with exposure to air over a period of time. The softness of the stone made it possible for the sculptor to chisel the minutest details. The interior of the temple is as richly adorned as the outer walls. Each of the pillars of the mandapa or hall is finely sculpted. Some have figures made upon them, while other pillars are so smoothly chiselled that they appear to be lathe-turned. 
There is a central ceiling panel which is also carved in great detail. This is in keeping with the tradition of sculpted ceilings in North Indian temples. There are bracket figures of beautiful women at each corner of the central bay of the Mandapa. One of the finest sculptures here is a pillar image. The fluidity of lines and the subtleties of body posture are remarkable. There is far less ornamentation and the figure shows a close relationship with the Chola idiom. Many finely carved temples stand in the present-day village of Halibid, which was the grand capital of the Hoysalas, known then as Dora Samudra. Built between 1121 and 1160, the profusely decorated temple of Hoysaleshwara is the most prominent structure here. In the words of historian Percy Brown, it is, without exaggeration, one of the most remarkable monuments ever produced by the hand of man. The Hoysaleshwara temple has two separate but connected shrines made on a single platform. As in the case of the Chenna Keshava temple, the towers or vimanas are missing, which gives a low and flat appearance to the temple. Like the previous temple, the Hoysaleshwara is profusely and intricately carved. There is no effort spared in creating a world of fine details and ornamentation. It is as if no labour is too great in attempting to show the glory of the manifestation of the Divine. Perhaps the splendour of ornamentation also reflects the tastes of the Hoysalas who were originally hill chieftains. It is certainly very different from the simpler and graceful forms made under the Chalukyas and the Cholas. Miniature Vimanas and Grand Dwarapalas are made at the entrances to the shrines. The carving is dazzling in its minute work and wealth of detail. The Dwarapalas stand in swaying postures and are heavy in the fulsome portrayal of the life force of nature. Past them, we come into the spacious interior of the temple. The polished and carved pillars are reminiscent of the earlier temple at Belur. The ceilings are again richly carved. The exterior of the temple, as in other Indic temples, provides a view of the world of separated forms that we perceive around us. Here they are seen as a manifestation of the deity enshrined in the Garbha Greha. In its wealth of detail, this is a highly ordered presentation of the numerous shapes in which we see the formless divine. In all these, our attention is drawn to the beauty and grace which underlies everything that exists. The deities are manifestations of philosophic concepts and the fine qualities within us. In response to their beauty, we are to be transported away from worldly cares, our thoughts taken to the divine which pervades it all. What strikes us most in ancient Indian art is that though deities, animals, plants and common people are made, there are no portraits of kings or other specific individuals. 
Of course, for a brief while, these come in during the rule of the Kushanas, who hailed from faraway China. In this late period of the 12th century, in some schools of art, such as this, there are still no portraits of kings. In Indic belief, it is the ego, which is the main source of all pain and confusion in the world. The object of art is to help us to realize the oneness and divinity of all of existence. However, by this period and more so, in this school of art, a change has occurred. Artists who preferred earlier to remain anonymous have inscribed their names with pride upon their works. However, a stylistic analysis shows that we cannot distinguish the work of one artist from another. As in earlier Indic schools of art, it is a collective style rather than individual ones. The region had a tradition of ivory and sandalwood carving, which continues till today. Hoysala sculpture was probably influenced by this form of miniature art. The lowest section of the temple wall has rows of reliefs of animals and birds. Elephants stand for stability and power and have traditionally been made at the base of the temple as if to hold it up. Lions symbolize the courage within us with which we must face the confusion and turmoil of the material world. The care and patience of the artist is seen in the fact that no two lions are alike in the relief which runs for 700 feet. The imagery on the Heusler, the Heusler temples in this, in this sort of, you know, this schist, this sharp stone that captures in miniature form so much precision of detail is one of the wonders of the history of Indian art. And the range of figures and animals that we find in horizontal reliefs as well as on panels is perhaps unparalleled throughout the whole temple architecture of India. But in the 12th and the 13th century in this part of Karnataka, we have this extraordinary range of imagery. Um, some scholars have studied the representations of Ramayana and Mahabharata on the great temples at Halibid and Belur and Somnathpur and other um, lesser known temples, but equally fine artistically. Other scholars have studied, for example, the um, representations of machinery for war, all the trappings of the elephants and the horses, the chariots, the weapons which the soldiers are carrying, the costumes that they wear, their shields, their helmets, the stirrups that are on the horses, all sorts of extraordinary details are there for us to study and some of these have already been recorded, examined and studied and we begin to ask how is it that these artists in this particular milieu for these patrons were particularly concerned to record all these things which perhaps they weren't in other environments. Again this is something we don't understand. Why is it that artists working for a Hoysala king in the 12th century in central Karnataka should be concerned to show these things but an artist working for a king in Tamil Nadu in the 9th century should not is something we can only speculate. But there is something to do with the 12th and 13th century. It's very great emphasis on military aspects and on war and on the representations of military aspects. That is, I think, a general feature of Indian art. If we compare the reliefs on the Hoysala temples with those at Konarak, let's say, in the 13th century, we see a similar obsession with showing the paraphernalia of kingship in a military guise and that the temple is a place where this has to be shown because obviously the king as a military leader as somebody who commands these forces is extremely important for the worship of gods. Above, 
practically the whole Hindu pantheon is depicted with an emphasis on the forms of Shiva. Scenes from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata and the main episodes of the Bhagavata Purana are also made on the walls. At Halabid are also finely sculpted temples made to the Jaina Tirthankaras. In keeping with Indic traditions, there were no barriers between the patronage of the temples of the different paths towards realization. Many queens and generals of the Hoysalas were Jainas. The Keshava temple at Somnathpur was made in 1268. The Vimana of the temple survives and gives us an idea of how the modest-sized towers of Hoysala times would have looked. Rather than impressive height, the emphasis remains on profuse sculptural decoration. The three shrines of the temple have almost human-sized figures of Vishnu in different forms. As Venu Gopala, he is seen in his incarnation as Krishna playing the flute. The Hoysala temples mark one of the most exuberant periods of Indian art. The artists of this time must have been among the most assiduous in their detailed work and most prolific in their output. It is the stylization in Indian art which is marked here, with less of the naturalism which was also seen before. While every fingernail is carved, the breath of life, which animates much of Indian sculpture, has given way to profuse ornamentation. An ornamentation which displays the grandeur of the Hoysala court and empire. Yeah. Mm -hmm.